Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. It's really early in California. So if you're joining from California, if you're joining from somewhere else, just feel free to use the chat box and introduce yourself where you're joining from. Um, I'm really excited about this session. I'm Dida Mikicic, I'm the moderator of the session, and I'm going to um, introduce our presenters, Debbie Forbes. Uh, hi, Debbie. Hi. And Evan Campbell. They are here today um, to talk make more, more about the digital equity, which we really need to learn more these days, right? Um, before we start, I would like to remind you a few things about the logistics. Uh, please ensure that your microphone is muted when you're not speaking to minimize background noise. And also, pre please pose your questions using the chat function that will moderate and discuss with our presenters later on. And toward the end of our, we'll share how we can continue the conversation online and share some additional sources to support your teaching. I'll also share uh, our YouTube channel in the chat box. You can find the recording of this session and all other sessions because you're missing two sessions right now <laughs> happening at the same time. So you can go back to our YouTube channel and watch the recording. And lastly, we are using automated Zoom captions that we will edit the recording transcripts before we share them with you. And at the bottom of uh, the Zoom window, you will see a closed caption button you, and you will see live transcript text underneath that button. You can click on to activate live transcription. So now I'd like to hand the microphone um, over to our presenters, Debbie Forbes and Evan Campbell. Welcome, Debbie and Evan. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and start our slideshow. So again, hello, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm, I appreciate you all being here with us today to hear about uh, digital equity in technology supported courses at Sinclair College, past and present, and maybe some future. Um, my name, again, is Debbie Fobbs, and I currently function in our eLearn division as an equity success coach in our flexible learning department. And um, of course, I work at Sinclair College in Dayton, Ohio. And for some of you who may need some geographical context, Dayton, Ohio is about an hour and 40 minutes north of Columbus and about an hour south of Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been with the Sinclair College now 20, 20 years. Sinclair College for a 135 years prides itself on living out the founder's motto, David Sinclair, find the need and endeavor to meet it with our 30 plus thousand student in attendance. Sinclair is so proud to share record numbers of graduates in 2022, 11,000 to be exact. That includes our underserved population. And you can see from the slide, the number of graduates for each category on the slide. But of course, this work is, is not done singularly. Uh, we have 2,500 of Sinclair's finest um, and who we affectionately call the secret sauce. So it's no surprise um, that Sinclair, a champion for student success, and with our eLearn division, would partner with ECMC, which is the Educational Credit Management Corporation, in July of 2021. And ECMC ensures all learners unlock their fullest potential. And so together, um, Sinclair, the eLearn division, and ECMC uh, we partnered to further the work on closing the achievement gaps, specifically with our African-American male population at the college, um, which back in 2021 um, showed a 13% retention gap when compared to all students within the college. And um, this partnership will, will, will sunset um, in 2024. So with this partnership, the work began. And Evan will now cover the making of Sinclair's equity rubric. So get ready to hear how good, how the good work at Peralta Community College informed uh, Sinclair College. Evan? Yeah, so a few years back before we 
got with the ECMC grant, we were working on the digital equity rubric and trying to figure out how we were going to do that. Um, when we found Peraltas, we were like, okay, this this is, they got it. They, they, they know what they're doing. Um, but we had already done a lot of work in the first five areas um, with technology, student resources, UDL diversity, and the images representation. But what we were missing was the human bias, the content meaning, and the connection and belonging. So we took those three um, criteria from the equity rubric, and we built them out to really help more um, look at the needs here at Sinclair. And we're going to go over what it looks like now a little bit later when we talk about the present. But uh, they really helped us inform what it is that we're looking for um, online in these online courses in the, in the course development. And then this also became the basis for a lot of the DEI training and initiatives that we use here. Um, we try to focus on these three and how do we bring that into the classroom and make it applicable. And so um, an equity conference uh, would never be complete without one of these rendering. And I'm sure you've seen other similar renderings. Um, it just is. What is justice? Fixing the system to offer equal access to both tools and opportunity. It just is. So moving forward here, you will see how our eLearn division worked to make both tools and opportunities available to all student learners in our technology supported courses, as well as work to provide connection and a sense of belonging in our courses. We can all say that it was, the pandemic was bad. We can all say what was bad about the pandemic and at the same time, we can say what was good about the pandemic. So in spring of 2020, the pandemic forced all students into online courses, increasing online enrollment by over 250%. We would say that's a good thing for the college, right? And then that, that the following summer, the first faculty coach collaborative coaching model began and it established the coaching to complete. And I'll go into some, some bullet points um, of exactly what the coaching to complete model was, that's in the past. So moving forward a year later, the work expanded so much that the Tutoring Learning and Center and the eLearn division partnered together to extend the coverage. There were so many students to support and faculty to support, and this work expanded 30%. Then you have the following fall, where the discussion of a permanent home to continue the coaching to complete program began and it transitioned um, at that time to permanently be housed in the tutoring and learning center. And then of course in spring 22 was fully um, under the umbrella of the tutoring and learning center. So this good work swept across our technology and supported courses with lightning speed and the flexible learning department where this good work was originally housed, um, shifted its focus to directly work with faculty in the technology supported um, courses, leaving the good people and our secret sauce in the tutoring learning and center to continue to work with our students um, in these um, technology courses. But before this good work moved to tutoring and learning center, you can see here that um, in the past, it was a student focused service model Coaches primarily serve students with um, secondary focus on faculty relationship, and you'll see how that changed in a little bit uh, with the new focus. And this particular bullet point um, carried forward to every, to every iteration of the model, improve student course success rates by focusing on social emotional learning and behavioral interventions. Of course, there's always encouraging student engagement, communication, interaction, and feedback. Um, the coaches help reduce the non-content related workload for faculty. And this model, um, the length of service was ongoing with our students. So as I, as I alluded to earlier, the, um, the success coaches now work directly with faculty in the courses. And you can see here that now the, the model has been iterated where coaches are now focused in um, faculty focused, 
Um, we're targeting new, newly developed courses in the first term of offering. And um, Evan will, um, Evan is the equity instructional designer. And so he will go into more of how that developed, um, especially when it comes to employing the equity rubric. Um, coaches work to facilitate a gentler, more intentional off-ramp for course coordinators participating in a course development or a vision project. Um, because uh, um, in, in the past, there would be where uh, courses are brand new and courses are newly revised and the teaching faculty would be on their own. And so this is why the model to make sure that the course were, um, was, um, was working for not only the faculty, teaching faculty, but for the students as well. Coaches also provided a continuous improvement um, in the course design and delivery, meaning that we would make gentle suggestions uh, and some proposed changes to the course as the term went by, the term went on. We would review e-learn content and deliver tools in conjunction with student performance and feedback. We would um, employ some targeted emails to our students to make sure that they're moving towards uh, course success. We would recommend continuous improvement. And we typically work with our faculty um, one to three terms. And um, really as the, as the model played out, we, we saw that we would only work for one term. And so, um, and then um, the ECMC partnership provided our e-learn division with funding to hire an equity success coach. Um, and I'm currently in that role to of course um, do similar work as the success coaches did with additional lens uh, on focus um, on equity in the, in the courses. And so you can see here, um, my role was to make sure that there was equitable student outcomes, um, um, support the high, support the classes that was high risk High, high attendance, but low risk success, low success. Train to use the equity rubric, and you'll hear Evan talk a lot more about exactly what the equity rubric um, look like and how it's employed in, in, the, in the classroom with the course. We designed to, um, the courses were designed to influence course design, um, course delivery, course support, and course data. And of course, here we go again, we always, we always provide emotional, and learning support for our students. Uh, we partner with faculty to improve student success, equitable learner-centered strategies and technologies. And we partner with um, the equity instruction designer to make sure that we were employing the equity rubric correctly in the course. We provided progress check-in and we always guided our students to, get, to mitigate any type of um, resource needs. We uh, refer them to our Sinclair Student Support Services mental health counseling and mentoring. And um, I said, uh, if you look at the slide, you will see a future on there because I'm really proud to say that um, as the equity success coach within the department, I'm now positioned uh, and I'm now currently creating training to, um, to inform the, the, um, the other success coaches, not only in the flexible learning department, as well as the tutoring learning center. And I'm really excited about that. And uh, we're hoping to start this in May. And so my last slide here describes how we currently collaborate with faculty in the technology supported courses and also incorporates a focus on equity in these courses. Our flexible, um, our flexible learning manager and the instructional um, manager um, got together behind the scenes to create a process that helps connect success coaches with faculty who benefits from this coach collaboration. And as you can see here, there's six buckets that we intentionally um, suggest to faculty. The first bucket, um, the master enhancements, that's done prior to the term beginning where we are, um, and even prior to meeting with faculty, where we are actually diving into the new course or the revised course, and we're reviewing and making um, gentle suggestions, proposed changes, and this is where we really pay attention to uh, making sure that the equity rubric has been employed within the class. And so that's before we even meet with faculty, we're doing this review work 
And then, um, and then in, before the start of the term, we would meet with our faculty and then we would go over these bullet points. And not all the bullet points will be needed because some faculty are more advanced than others. And so but we make sure that they're ready to teach their course um, with these bullet points. And then the third bucket here, we have um, reasonable student interaction and the DEI is employed within the course. And this is where um, my work comes in. Um, um, you can see here one of the bullet points says utilizing when life happens. And that is a resource that I created in my work to get under any academic or non-academic concerns for students. And this tool is, is being used um, in the new courses and the revised courses to get students to the student affairs area for mental health and um, counseling and other types of um, needs to be met. And so we go over these uh, with our faculty and, um, and throughout the entire term, we are meeting with them on a regular basis. And so those, those, um, those bottom buckets, the teaching shell, the student performance, and the close out next steps, we would be talking with them on, on these particular items to make sure that this optimization is being done throughout the term, students' performance is being done throughout the term, making sure that students are moving towards success and mitigating any um, needs for resources. And of course, at the very end of each term, we would then um, create a wrap-up summary with our uh, faculty, and we would um, then remind them of the suggestions and the proposed changes. We will then work with um, the instructional um, designer who was assigned to the course originally, and together we would make changes in the master shell so that um, future terms could be downloaded into, uh, into future teaching shells. So I will now turn it over to Evan to share just how he's designed the equity rubric to be used in our technology supported courses. I was getting my cursor confused with yours. Um, so I want to show you exactly what we turned the equity rubric into. Can you go to the next slide. So for the first part, we have human bias. And you know, this is where we work to reduce those different biases that we all have. Um, we did this by acknowledging within our syllabus, the template um, in multiple places um, that we are a inclusive place that we respect one another and respect each other's views and that we are working on our different biases. Um, one of the most important parts that we have in here is where it says the instructor verbalizes self-reflection of their own biases. Um, it's important to have it in the syllabus, but it's far more important to have it in the classroom because, well, we know students don't always read the syllabus, uh, but to have the instructor say it out their mouth makes it much more sincere and authentic. Um, and, and it will make your students much more apt to uh, understand you and to, and to believe you when they say that you are trying to check those biases. Um, the next one is content meaning. Um, and that's just, you know, that is pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's what is the content that we're putting in front of them? Um, what is the narrative that the content was created under? Uh, we, I know, I don't know about everybody, but uh, I've seen down in uh, Florida that they're doing a lot of bills around uh, education and what goes in a textbook. So those are the type of things that we have to think about. What is the um, uh, agenda with which some of these sources that we put in front of students um, was created with? And is there a first person source that we can offer instead of teaching out of a textbook about the Holocaust, you give them the diary of Anne Frank. Um, or, or There's so many ways in, in that we can connect uh, students with the work um, outside of traditional ones and ones that are always um, influencing from whatever the dominant culture is. One thing I always tell people is that culture isn't just uh, where you're born, your race or anything like that. Culture is a language, it's a sound, it's a fashion. So 
Um, if you are into hip hop music, that's a culture. If you are a, a nerd who likes Marvel movies and video games, that's its own culture. Each it, when you get into these things, they have their own language. If I start talking about NPCs and mods, if you don't play video games, it's not something that you'll understand. So, um, you know, when we think about culture, we have to kind of expand our minds and think about all the different ways culture can happen. And, and you know, two people from opposite sides of the world can connect if they are both into rock music. You know, and can talk about Aerosmith and. And, and, and get into all these different bands, they can connect in a different way, even though they're from other sides of the world and, and, and think and do things completely different. Um, and so that's very important. It goes to the content. And I'll, and I'll show you later how we are doing some of these things here at Sinclair as well. Uh, okay, next one. So then the next uh, part is the connection and belonging, and that's cultivating the caring environment between uh, students, but also um, between the student and instructor. Um, it's very important that instruction is responsive and substantive. Uh, we want to make sure that it's not just correspondence education. I don't know about everyone here, but I've been in a um, online class where it's basically a check-in and do this sort of class, and that isn't very helpful. Um, I remember not enjoying the class more than I can even remember the subject of the class. So uh, it is very important for us to try and find those ways to connect with each other. And some of that comes with, um, you know, checking your biases. Some of that comes with putting uh, meaningful content in front of them. But it also comes with how are you designing your discussion questions? Are you giving your students a chance to really interact with one another or are they just kind of passing by in the class and not really um and, and when you get into the research you know that when the students are able to um take charge of their learning and, and be more involved in this way it only makes it that much uh more effective um go to the next slide so those were so that's the equity rubric that we came up here with at uh, Sinclair based off of Peralta's. Um, and now I want to show you how that has informed some of the things that we've done. So when um, reviewing new courses or updated courses, we put them through a whole list of uh, criteria. The equity rubric helped us create the criteria that we put our courses through. So you can see here in the first box a statement inviting the student to address their own human bias, uh, providing methods uh, to address them in the classroom. So not only that one, but the fourth one down, a statement about the course being a open and welcoming safe space. Um, both of those are in the uh, syllabus. And, and this is where we talk about the design of the class again. So this is, these are things that we can see from an instructional design standpoint um, in the class, in the course, and, and what the students will see when they're navigating through their online courses. Um, we wanna make sure that it's in the syllabus, but like I said earlier, we also wanted to make sure there was a way for students to verbalize, uh, or not the teacher to verbalize this in the classroom as well. Because um, as helpful it is to do the design, we can't, as an instructional designer, I can't be there in the class and get the teacher to do everything I want them to do. Um, another part is that the learning materials, examples, and assignments represent a variety of cultures and backgrounds and experiences, as well as one of the topics, and at least one of the topics, uh, being connected to non-dominant cultures. And that's the content meaning piece that um, really trying to, to expand on the perspectives of the assignments that we're handing them. And the final one is that the course uh, includes activities where participants, participants can freely interact, and that is the connection and belonging piece. So these are the things that we as instructional designers can look and can call out and can make sure are in the design of the course for all students when ever uh, they're in any online course. Uh, 
that is one of the first things that we did when we took the equity rubric, when we realized that there needed to be more um, for the faculty here and the students here at St. Clair. Uh, can you go to the next slide? And Evelyn, before we, I go to the next slide, I want to say here, this is the exact um, review criteria that as an equity success coach and the other success coaches within the department, this is what we use as we review these new courses as, as coaches in our role. So one of the things that we wanted to do uh, here, Sinclair, was create a DI repository. And the idea behind this repository is to create a bunch of assignments that can be used in a number of different classes, regardless of subject matter, that um, both hit the course objectives, but also offer that global perspective, that um, non-dominant culture uh, perspective, where we can show people that, you know, there's whatever it is that you're learning, there's so much more than just um, America or our idea of how we got here. So this was a assignment that I came up with for a physics class and it, it's real simple. These are all physicists um, and it shows some of them are, unfortunately this repository is at St. Clair. Um, it, uh, hopefully it can become something a little more ubiquitous in the future so that everybody can can reach to it but the you know i i know that one of the things in the dei space that a lot of people have re seen recently is that um as much as we talk about it it's very hard to um find meaningful initiatives or impactful initiatives um uh a lot of times it's a lot of lip service so one of the things that i notice is that for the faculty members who are um, hesitant or reluctant towards some of these things, um, the best thing you can do is make it as easy as possible because um, they're going to be more swayed by results than anything. So that was the idea behind this repository is to create a place where they say, oh, it's too hard to come up with these assignments or this is too difficult or I, I, I'm not used to this. I'm like, listen, it's very easy. We got it here. And if nothing else, you can get ideas towards um so other things that you can do so this is a very simple assignment to come up with you know a little information about each of these and then there's a we have study mates here at um, Sinclair which helps create a bunch of activities based off of uh information sets like this so you can you know faculty here can quickly create a, a crossword or a flash deck or any number of things uh with something like this you can go to the next slide please this is an assignment that I created for a French class. Each one of these countries is a Francophile country. Um, the student can click each one of those points and learn a little bit, and then they can scroll down and do a matching game. And this is, again, it's real simple. You know, it's a French class, but it is a way of showing, you know, the extent that um, France has had influence on the world. It also is something that if you are learning French, you can look at a map and say, look at all the places that I can take this lesson or the things that I'm learning and go and use it. Um, there are all the opportunities out there in, in these places now that I can speak French. So again, this is just, you know, simple ways of expanding um, the scope so that students understand that they can take what they're learning and use it outside of America, or that there's application um, outside of America, or it came in its inception from outside of America. Can you go to the next slide? So this is a assignment that I created for a chemistry class. Um, I know that the sciences and the maths can be even harder to um, find those DEI assignments and find a way. So doing things like this, I thought would be very helpful. The idea behind the assignment is that the students will research chemical processes and um, break it down into a timeline of how that process came to be. So with the black line is the process of 
pasteurization. Um, and so you can see it started in China and then has history in Japan before getting all the way over to Europe. And this is before it ever makes its way to America. And this way it's a visual representation for students to see uh, how many countries and, 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 and how many continents are involved in even the simple things that we do today. Uh, it's, it's very, th this is the type of expanding that I'm, I, I wanna, I hope that we can bring into the classroom so that students can see off bat like, oh wow, there's so much more to this than whatever you think it is. Even the technology in your phone is the accumulation of technological advances over decades and, and, and across all different uh, sorts of borders and in so many other uh, places. So this is the type of expanded hope that we can do. Um, you go to the next slide. And so then we took all, we took some of this stuff and we put it all into a training that me and Debbie just created here. It actually went live, I believe just a little over a month ago here at Sinclair that all new hires and course developers go through um, it's broken down into the three parts of human bias content meaning and digital uh sorry not digital equity um con a connection and belonging and the idea is just giving um our faculty here as many resources as possible and as much information as possible around this so that they can apply all this in their room you know the equity rubric was great for us in instruction and design to help them design their courses for um, for online and 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 that's great, but it's still on them to apply and to understand these things in the classroom, and that's what we created with the training was a way for them to better understand and do that. Uh, so that's where we got into the present. Um, real quick, I want to go over uh, just a couple of things that we're working on, and then we can spend the rest of the time answering questions. Uh, can you go to the next slide for me, Debbie? One more. So the future here of DI at Sinclair is we are currently working um, with our CTL to create some more um, kind of like certifications we're going to have more workshops but the idea is to create a way for students to uh, recognize the teachers who are putting in the work on in the equity space so that uh, when they take their classes we can see what uh, the difference yields between the teachers who have taken an interest in equity and those who have it so that we can um, I think just better in the future argue the uh, merit and effectiveness of these type of initiatives. Uh, you know, next slide. And then it's also just getting in front of more departments and uh, uh, people. The, the, the difficult part is uh, in this space, a lot of times it is the people who are most apt towards um, these type of initiatives and these type of changes that come to these presentations that do these trainings, which is great and we love that, but we do want to reach those who are reluctant and who are hesitant. Um, and that's a little more difficult and that takes us really reaching out and getting in front of big departments and that way we can find the people who are, I don't want to say hiding, but maybe, uh, or avoiding, but maybe just not uh, very keen on all that we're doing here. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, the past and present um, here uh, for DEI. I know I saw some questions, so I, you know, I'm, I think we got 10 minutes here to try to get through some of them. Evan and Debbie, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this presentation, and I, I'm super excited to hear that. Um, Peralta Online Equity Rubric was an inspiration for you. Yes. Um, I see that human bias, content meaning, connection and belonging, these are the things um, that were that inspired you to adapt in your rubric. Um, and actually, I should say that this presentation is inspiring for all of us as well. I really would like to go back and watch this recording again because you shared so many wonderful ideas 
wonderful projects, as Amy mentioned in the chat box. So thank you so much. Um, I, I want to just <laughs> shut up now because I see that a lot of questions in the chat box waiting for you to answer. So mm. I am asking participants if you would like to unmute yourself and speak your question or um, do you want me to read it out for you? Either works for me. Thanks. Yeah, you, you should go ahead and read it out. Um, that's fine. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to start with Sam. Sorry, Karen. Uh, Karen asked, would you connect uh, the explicit statement of bias with the practice of stating one's positionality in qualitative research? Oh, I'm gonna have my need a little explanation on that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, say that again. Uh, would you connect the explicit statement of bias mm -hmm. with the practice of stating one's positionality in qualitative research. And Karen, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to elaborate on that question. Yeah, so um, in certain practices of qualitative research, there's often a statement within the write-up that says how you think your perspective and history has shaped how you engage with the research. And so mm -hmm. it's less about bias as, which I think, um, perhaps implies a, a judgment or a defect maybe, and more just saying, here's who I am and here's the perspective I'm coming from and here's how I think it influences my work so that you can then, as a reader, look at this work knowing that that's the lens through which I did my work. And so it just seemed like a different way of, but it seemed like the same kind of practice, kind of acknowledging that your history and your perspective shapes how you're approaching the space. Absolutely. I think that that's really important. One of the things that we have in our training is when checking your bias, it's very helpful to uh, announce that to your students. Um, I put, it's in the training. It, we had a little template for how you do that. And that's, you know, simple as coming in and saying, hey, I see that we have a lot of diversity here. Um, I think that's wonderful. I personally don't know everything and I am still learning. So please, feel free to come up and check me or let me know if I say something that is out of pocket or, or makes you feel um, any sort of way that is not my intention. Um, as we are all learning, let's try and be as respectful as possible um, when engaging with one another um, in these conversations. That goes a long way because there are so many students and so many people who um, assume when they get into a situation uh, that they think they're dealing with bias that the person um, has ill intentions. And uh, oftentimes we don't know when we are making someone feel um, marginalized because we, we don't have their lived experience. So mm -hmm. uh, it's important just to make sure that people understand that that's that you're always coming with empathy and equity in mind so that they feel comfortable talking to you and addressing it when it happens. And Evan, I always like how you train us to think that uh, we tend to think human bias is against, but sometimes our bias is for as well. I like that. Mm -hmm. So there are tons of biases where you can be uh, biased towards something. Like one of them is uh, 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 the halo effect. So if you find out something um, that you like about a person, they donate it to uh, breast cancer awareness. You know, you might be a little more likely to overlook something later on because you know something about them that you do like. So bias can happen both for something and against something. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and another question for, is from Sam. Uh, Sam asks, do you have any templated language you could share uh, about acknowledging bias? I could try and find it as quickly as I can and drop it in here. Um, we can go to the next question, but I will see as quickly as I can if I can find it and, and drop it in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and. Um, 
feel free to do so. Also, I share the YouTube channel, so you can also share resources under your recording. Uh, if you go to um, our YouTube channel that I shared in the chat box. So yeah, feel free to share questions or resources uh, and continue that conversation in our YouTube channel as well. And Karen has another question. Do, do students get to provide feedback on some of these items? So uh, as the equity success coach in the classroom, we employ uh, many, um, several surveys, uh, one of them, would be getting to know you survey is one of them. And then we have a survey that's called you belong here survey. After about the fourth week of each term, we recognize the students may be struggling with reasons why they need to withdraw from the course. Maybe life's happening. Maybe they think they took on too much with the course. They don't like the teacher's um, um, teaching style, any number of reasons. And so we, we survey our students to make sure that they recognize that they belong here in this classroom to be successful. And sometimes maybe students do have to withdraw and we, we deal with that as well. And then at the very end of the term, um, in our work as coaches, we also um, survey the students to get them to help us understand how they experience the course for the term. So we do get the feedback from students to make the course better for future terms and future students taking the course. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Debbie. And um, Deborah has a question. Is the focus of the course review criteria primarily for leaning activities such as discussions and assignments? And how are you enhancing the equity DEI content in course materials such as textbooks? It's not just about the discussions. It's really more of a 360. So one of the ones that I told you that um we didn't focus on in the uh rubric was images and representation it because you know we had other stuff in there but it is one of the biggest things when we talk about content meaning is what are the images that are going to be in there what are the uh videos that we are using um so it it, it is more than that but the again the, the hard part is um we as instructional designers use the equity rubric. That's how we help design the class, but we are not the subject matter expert. We are not the facilitator. We are not the instructor. So we can't be in the class. We can't choose the textbooks. We can't choose the sources. The best thing that we can do is give the information to those who are and hope that they are implementing it to the best of their abilities. Um, so from that aspect, you know, there's only so much power that we have to, to do that. Um, but we try to uh, offer up as many uh, more sources and, 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 and more tools for our instructors and facilitators so that um, it, it's not just about the, the discussions or what uh, assignments that they write. Mm -hmm. And as equity success coaches and coaches in general, we would make gentle suggestions in our review process and um, recommend um, other type of um, resources that possibly a faculty could consider. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have one more, one more minute and one more question to answer. So, um, Maria said, I teach Spanish GED and I need to translate materials in Spanish. Would I be able to translate the materials in these lessons? Absolutely, yes. I think, uh, and I think that's a, that's a giant part. Um, UDL is something that I'm always a proponent of. And, you know, when you do it, when you're using universal design for learning, you wanna have, um, translations available for the students who are going to need them um, so that there aren't any barriers. So I'm always a, a fan of captions, translations, and everything else like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't see any other questions other than um, people are asking if those resources are accessible and if there's a way you can share it with them, with everyone. Um, and we are we are happy to share it with all uh, the present all, all the participants in this conference. If you send them to us, if you prefer to do so, uh, but also again the recording will be available in the YouTube channel I just shared in the chat box. But let me ask Evan and 
Debbie, would you be willing to share the resources? I think we have to double check with our bosses, but I, I will see if we can make that happen. Sure, of course. Thank you so much again. I really, really appreciate it. This is yeah, really I mean. And um, again, we will certainly go back and watch this once more. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your practices. We really appreciate it. And everyone, we have um, another session starting at nine. If you are available, if you're willing to join, our uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Tina Vasconcelos, will do uh, the keynote uh, speech uh, very soon. So uh, we hope to see you there. And um, if you don't have any other questions, any comments, feel free to log off. And we look forward to seeing you in 15 minutes in another room. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.